In conclusion to the tribe of Judah, I'd like to get one more scripture. Uh, this is Luke 21 and 20. And when you shall see Jerusalem come past with armies. So this was Christ speaking to the Pharisees and Sadducees and to the nation of Israel, showing that the Roman armies was going to come past Jerusalem. Read on. Then know that the desolation thereof is not. Know that the desolation and destruction of us as a nation of people and of our rulership. Read on. Was going to come to an end under the Romans. Read on. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. So those who are in Judea, which is Jerusalem, flee to the mountains. The mountains also represents Masada and down into the interiors of West Africa. Read on. And let them which are in the midst of it depart out. He said, depart out of Jerusalem. Why? Because the Romans was going to destroy Jerusalem. Like we read in the book called Babylon to Timbuktu, what happened to Jerusalem. Read on. And let not them that are in the countries enter their into. He said, and those that are into the countries return not back into it because there's going to be great slaughter and great atrocities. Read on. Verse 22. For these be the days of vengeance. For these were the days of vengeance upon us for disobeying and breaking the Most High's laws as a nation of people. Read on. That all things which are written may be fulfilled. That all things that are written where? In the prophecies of the Old Testament by Moses and all the prophets had to be fulfilled. And this was the fulfillment of what Christ was speaking about. And us coming to Americas as slaves. Read on. But woe unto them that are with child. So that's it on that one. So we, we're going to begin now with uh, Issachar and Zebulon. Zebulon represents the Indians drug from uh, Guatemala to Panama, and Issachar represents the Mexican Indians known as the Aztecs. So I would like to begin with Genesis 49 or 13. It says, Zebulon shall dwell at the haven of the sea. Now, Jacob was speaking to his son Zebulon. He said, Zebulon, like I said, are the Indians through Guatemala to Panama. Zebulon, which, which were known as the Mayans when the Spaniards came to the uh, New World. Zebulon shall dwell at the haven of the sea. The haven of the sea that he's talking about is the area known as the Panama Canal Zone. And he shall be for a haven of ships. And he shall be for a haven of ships, meaning the major docking point where all ships come in and out for exporting and importing. And when you look at the Panama Canal Zone, it cuts the trip around the world from the Pacific to the Atlantic Ocean. That's why the Panama Canal Zone was built based on the prophecy that Zebulon will be a haven of ships. Read on. And his border shall be unto Zidon. So back in ancient time, even Zebulon used to dwell at the sea coast, and his border extended up until Zidon. Going on. Verse 14. Issachar is a strong ass. Now we're speaking about Issachar, which represents the Aztec Indians, known to as the Mexicans, not the Spanish, but those of Indian descent. They call himself Azteca. Read on. Issachar is a strong ass. So he said Issachar is a strong ass, meaning he's a strong, hard worker. Read on. Couching down between two burdens. And the two burdens that he couching down is what? It's uh, Mexico, which uh, is North America, and Central America. And the two burns also the burn that he carries upon his back during all his hard labors. Right. Let me let me say they always show um the Mexicans that one of their symbols is a is an ass. That's one of their famous uh, symbols. Let me get this picture. Right. The burro. Right. The burro, like you said. Real quick. Okay. This is from this book entitled Mexico Feast and Famine. Okay. And inside, they show you the Mexicans riding on the border. Let me open it, open to it right here. On what page? Uh, there's no page number on it in this oh. book. Okay. So, let me continue. Verse 15. And he saw that rest was good. And me and the rest was a pleasant land. And the rest that it also have is what they call a siesta, where they stop working at 12 o'clock noonday and they rest. And they don't do no work. Right. Many of the, some, a few of the Latin American countries uh, also do that. However, it's the Mexicans who have become famous for it. Anytime you hear of a siesta, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? The Mexicans. Okay. I'll read it again. And he saw that rest was good. And it was also a good land, a beautiful land. Read on. And the land 
that it was pleasant. The land is a beautiful land. So that's where all the American tourists go. When they want to go for a vacation, they run down to Mexico, Tijuana, uh, Puerto Vallarta, and all the different places in Mexico. Read on. And bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant so, unto tribute. So he bowed his shoulder. When the Spaniards came over and conquered them, the conquistadores, they bowed the shoulder and became servants. And he says, they bowed the sho his shoulder to bear and became a servant unto tribute. They were oppressed by, this, by the Spaniards, had them working in, in, our, in our silver mines. And even up until this present day, that's why America is taking NAFTA down to Mexico to pay the Mexican workers a minimum wage because they are hard workers. His name, Issachar, means he is hired. And the white man knows this prophecy. That's why he exploit and use the Mexicans as uh, cheap, uh, cheap labor. Right, even here in, in the city, whenever the Japanese or the white man in general wants a cheap labor, who do they get? The Mexicans, and pay them less than minimum wage. Because they say, none of the other, the blacks surely ain't going to work right. for that, or none of the other uh, Spanish-speaking tribes, but get the Mexicans. You could pay them a buck fifty an hour. They'll do it. Right. Okay. So now, Deuteronomy let's go to Deuteronomy 33. 18 and 19. Right. So we're doing Zebulon and Issachar, because these two tribes are interrelated. They connect borders. Mexico runs all the way down extends down to uh, uh, to Guatemala and all the different uh, El Salvador and so forth. All these were the families of the, of, the, of the Aztecs and the Mayans. And they closely had close relationship. Right. So Deuteronomy 33, verse 18. And of Zebulon, he said, Rejoice, Zebulon, in thy going out, and Issachar in thy tent. So Zebulon rejoiced in their going out when they used to keep their feast. Now, not talking about the wicked feast that they kept when they went off into wickedness. When they came here first, they were keeping the righteous sacrifices. But then they went off into wickedness, which is sacrificing uh, the people on the altars and uh, cutting the hearts out. I went off into mass wickedness. So it says, Rejoice, Zebulon, in thy going out, and Issachar in thy tents. Who was in the tents of Zebulon? The Aztecs. That's why they used to travel back and forth and used to exchange gifts. Right. They were close relatives. Verse 19. They shall call the people unto the mountain. Right, the ones that did the calling was Issachar. During the Middle Ages, they were called the Aztecs because the verse above it says, Rejoice, Zebulon, in thy going out, and Issachar in thy tents. So it was, it was Issachar that remained in their tents, the Aztecs. They would blow the horn at the, uh, at the uh, feastly occasions and call the tribe of Zebulon up, which were the Mayans, and there they would do sacrifices, okay, sacrifices of righteousness. So I'll read on. There they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness, for they shall suck of the abundance of the seas and of treasures hid in the sand. And when you look it up, the word Panama means, it means the riches of the seas, to, to, the riches of the sea. So Panama is rich in the abundance of fish and all the riches that's in the sea. So it's telling you right here about Zebulon and Issachar too. Right. The, um, in ancient times, they... Actually, before we came to this side of the world, the Aztecs and the Mayans, back in Jerusalem, they really had sacrifices of righteousness. Now, a lot of you know the history that when they came over here, the Spanish discovered them sacrificing human flesh. Okay, is that recorded in the Bible? Yes. Let's go to, um, briefly, Hosea chapter, I think it's 8 and 13. Hosea chapter 8 and 13. Right. Hosea 8 and 13, yes. They sacrifice flesh for the sacrifices of my offerings. Right. They sacrifice flesh for the sacrifices of mine offerings. You heard about Montezuma the first, Montezuma the second. A lot of the great kings of the Aztecs and the Mayans, they were sacrificing flesh for the sacrifices of the Most High's offerings. They became wicked, and the Bible bears witness to that. Read. Read it again. They sacrifice flesh for the sacrifices of my offerings. And eat it. And <laughs> eat it. So what kind of flesh was they sacrificing? Human flesh. Check out the history. They were sacrificing one another and eating, the, ripping the hearts out of the chest and then eating it. And giving it to the gods. Right, and, get, and offering it to these strange gods that they were making up. Okay, Baal. Okay, read on. But the Lord accepted them not. Right, because this was the time of prophecy that all things written should be fulfilled, that all vengeance would come down upon Israel. Read. Now will he remember their iniquity 
and visit their sins. Right, so the Lord said now he will remember their sins. He's going to visit them. In what form did the Lord visit them? In the form of the Spaniard conquistadors. When they came in 1492 and destroyed them, from 1492 on, read, they shall return to Egypt. They shall return to Egypt, meaning they shall return to captivity. Okay, so now, let's go back to, did we finish Deuteronomy 33? Uh, 33, and uh, we're down to the, yes, you finished that. So I'd like to list that the angels today that's living down in, uh, from Guatemala, Panama, they're known as the Kunas, the Chucos, and the San Blas Indians. Those are all descendants of the, uh, the Mayan Indians today that's occupying from Guatemala to Panama. Right, let me go to this book briefly entitled uh, The Hope of Israel, written by Manessa Ben Israel. Okay, these were records that this so-called white man had scribed concerning the Indians that he came across. The Hope of Israel, written by Manessa Ben Israel. Okay, these were records that this so-called white man had scribed concerning the Indians that he came across. And by the word, way, the word Indian comes from the Latin word India, which means servant. That's what it means. So I'm going to go to page 112. I shall speak somewhat in this discourse of the divers opinions which have been and shall declare in what countries it is thought the ten tribes are. I'm going to jump down. You must know, therefore, that Alexo Venagas says that the first colonies of the West Indies were of the Carthaginians, meaning Israelites, that's what it's making reference to, who first of all inhabited Hispaniola, which is the Dominican Republic, and as they increased spread to the island of Cuba, from thence to the continent of America, and after that towards Panama, New Spain, and Peru. Okay, so this guy is letting you know that the Israelites were spread in the Dominican Republic, Cuba, uh, America, Panama, New Spain, meaning Mexico, and Peru. And this will end the conclusion in Zebulon and Issachar, but this verse is mainly about Issachar. First Chronicles 12 and 32. And of the children of Issachar. And the children of Issachar, which are the Mexicans, known back then as the Aztecs, read on. Which were men that had understanding of the times. Which were men that had understanding of the times. The times were what? To understand astronomy and astrology. Knowing the zodiac, reading the heavens. Read on. To know what Israel ought to do. And they, they knew what Israel had to do at certain occasions. The heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their command. So all their brethren were at their command when they would foresee and read the heavens. So when you go back in the history, even the Aztecs had calendars, and they knew, they even foretold of uh, futuristic prophecies that occur when you read the, uh, the codex and the history of the Aztecs on the, the writings on the pyramids. So this will end the conclusion of uh, Zebulon and Issachar. Now we're going to Dan. Right. To the, uh, the Dan, the tribe of Dan. Genesis 49 and 17. And by the way, the word Dan means judge. Okay. Verse 17 says, Dan shall be a serpent by the way. So back in ancient time, when Dan was a judge, Dan was like a serpent to the enemies of the nation of Israel. Like a serpent in the way waiting to attack his enemies. Read on. An adder in the path. So an adder is a poisonous snake. So when Dan attacked our enemies, it was a vicious and a hard attack. Read on. That biteth the horse's heels. So uh, like a horse bite, like a serpent will bite the horse's heel, and it will cause the, the, he, uh, the horse to run up backwards and fall backwards. So Dan was like an attacker, an busher against our enemies. Read on. So that his rider shall fall backwards. So Dan destroyed our enemies. And also, too, this is saying, Dan caused the nation of Israel to go back into idolatry when you read the history of Dan. Okay, so now we're going to go to Deuteronomy 33 and verse 22 to continue on Dan. And of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp. So Dan had a characteristic of a lion's whelp too, a, a courageous, warlike people. Right, like with Samson, he was one of the main ones. Of okay. the judge of Israel. Right. It reads on, he shall leap from Bashan. Now when it says Dan shall leap from Bashan, Dan was situated in the northern part of Israel. So when he says Dan shall leap from Bashan, meaning Dan was going to leap from, from where he was occupying and blend into the rest of the tribes of Israel. Because what happened to Dan, 
When you read in the book of Revelation, it's not, it's not mentioning Dan. Why? Because Dan was blended in with the rest of the tribes of Israel. Here's right, one. and to, to prove that, we're going to go to the New Testament in Revelation chapter 7. Okay, the tribe of Dan, they weren't destroyed as people, but they no longer had a, an inheritance. Like in the past, when the Levites no longer had an inheritance, so in this day and age, the tribe of Dan no longer has an inheritance. The proof of that is Revelation chapter 7. I'm going to read verses 1 down to 8. I'm going to read it swiftly. If you want to interject, right. do so. It says, And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth. So that's the destruction that's going to come from the four corners of the earth, the nuclear destruction that's coming against all nations. Read on. No on the sea, no on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. That's Christ, the Hawasha, right. Jesus Christ. And the seal of the living God is the shield of David. And also the knowledge of the Bible that's going to be planted into the minds of the Israelites. Right. Read on. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. So who's going to bring destruction? The angels under the orders of the Most High. The angels are holding back this great destruction until a set appointed time. Read on. Saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. So he said, don't hurt the trees, the seas, or anything until the servants of the Most High have sealed with the knowledge of the Bible that they are the Israelites and that the kingdom of heaven, which is going to be on earth, is coming to the Israelites and all nations going to serve us in slavery. Read on. Verse 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed in hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of all the tribes of the children of Israel, not the Africans, not the Chinese, not the Japanese, but the Israelites. Read on. Of the tribe of Judah was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Judah was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben was sealed 12,000. Reuben 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad was sealed 12,000. Gad 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher 12,000. Of the tribe of Naphtali was sealed 12,000. Naphtali 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh was sealed 12,000. Manasseh 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon was sealed 12,000. Simeon 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi was sealed 12,000. Levi 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar was sealed 12,000. 12, Issachar 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulon was sealed 12,000. Zebulon 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph was sealed 12,000. Which represents Ephraim 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin 12,000. These are the top leaders, the cabinet rulers of the nation of Israel. So right here is, is showing you that Dan was not there. The name of Dan was not there. Why? Because Dan was blended in amongst all the rest of the tribes. Right. And what does this also prove? That the 12 tribes of Israel were not destroyed. That they are alive and well in these last days because this is Christ speaking to John. Letting us know that before this destruction, the 12, 12,000 leaders of all the 12 tribes of Israel would be sealed with the knowledge of who they are and that the kingdom of heaven is strictly for them. Let me just read verse 9 for the smart people in the audience. <laughs> After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Okay, so what is this talking about? The Israelites that were coming out of all nations. Briefly, real quick, go to Isaiah 11, and I believe it's verse 11, to prove that this people that came out of all nations, kindreds, and tongues is the Israelites. Because a lot of you try to be smart and go, see, that includes everybody. It's that means all, everybody. It's all of the nation. Right. And so is that it? Verse Isaiah 11? 11, 11. Right. And it says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time. The second time meaning when he comes back. Right. To, restore, to recover the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria, from Egypt, from Paphros, from Cush, from Elam, and from Shinar, and from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel. Who? The outcasts of Israel. The outcasts of Israel, read. And gather together the dispersed of Judah, from the four corners of the earth. Do you hear that? So that explains Revelation 
7, and that verse we had read about them coming out of all nations. Okay, so stop the strange doctrine of including the Chinese, the Japanese, the Hawaiians. No, this ain't for you. This is only for the 12 tribes of Israel coming out of all nations under the earth. All right, so with that, we're moving on to the next tribe, which is God, which means truth, which is the so-called North Americans, known as the Cheyenne, the Sioux, the Apache, the, Nav uh, the Cheyenne, the Apaches, and so forth. This is what you call the so-called North American Indians, Native American Indians. Now, I want to stress this point because you have scholars and so-called biblical scholars saying, well, uh, North Amer Native American Indians are Chinese. They came from the Bering Strait. This is a bold-faced, blatant lie. You're looking at a so-called North American Indian right here. That's Nathaniel right. Nathaniel Alaga. Since you made that statement, let's go into this book entitled History of the American Indians by James Adair. Okay. He wrote this book in 17, let me look at it real 75. quick, 1775, and it was first published in the United States in 1930. Let's read about, did he find anything about the Native American Indians being descended from the Chinese? I'm going to go to page uh, 13, page 13 and 14. Bear with me, here, here comes right here, all right, I got it. It says, some have supposed the Americans, meaning the Indians throughout the North America, to be descended from the Chinese, but neither their religion, laws, customs, and, and etc. agree in the least with those of the Chinese, which sufficiently proves they are not of that line. I'm going to go to page 14 now. Neither could persons sail to America from the north, referring to the Bering Straits, that lie that you push in schools that the so-called Indians came through the Bering Straits. I'm going to read it again. Neither could persons sail to America from the north by the way of the Tartary or ancient Scythia that from its situation never was or can be a maritime power. And it is utterly impractical, impractical for any to come to America by sea from that quarter. <laughs> Besides, the remaining traces of their religious ceremonies and civil and martial customs are quite opposite to the like vestiges of the old Scythians, meaning the old Chinese. Okay, nor even in the moderate northern climates is it to be seen the least vestige of any ancient stately buildings or of any thick settlements as are said to remain in the less healthy regions of Peru and Mexico. Several of the Indian nations assure us they crossed the Mississippi before they made their present northern settlements. That's why they call them um, uh, the Indian Indians Arawaks, meaning when they traveled from the southern coast of uh, South America or made their way up, which connected with the former arguments will sufficiently explode that weak opinion of the American Aborigines being linearly descended from the Tartars or ancient Scythians, meaning the Orientals. Jump, in, jump down. From, from the most exact observations I could make in the long time I traded among the Indian Americans, I was forced to believe them linearly descended from the Israelites, either while they were a maritime power or soon after the general captivity. The latter, however, is the most probable. This descent I shall endeavor to prove from their religious rites, civil and martial customs, their marriages, funeral ceremonies, manners, language, traditions, and a variety of particulars, which will at the same time make the reader thoroughly acquainted with the nations, of which it may be said to this day, very little have been known. Right. Okay. So I'd like to show in this book, too, called Native Americans, on page 55, you have a group of Apache scouts. Then on page 67, you have a, you have a, a, a warrior. On page 67, when you see on the screen. Then on page 78, you have another warrior. Then on page 98, you have another Indian warrior. Showing you these are not Chinese. So let's go on to the scriptures, and the first scripture we're going to begin with is Genesis 49 and the 19th verse. Okay. Gad, a troop shall overcome him. Now stop. It said, Gad, a troop shall overcome him. The troop that overcame the so-called North American Indians were, was the U.S. Cavalry. Beginning with many different generals, but Custer was the, mace, the, the, the main famous one. And he had other generals after custom. And from that point, they were destroyed and defeated by the U.S. Cavalry. Right. So that's the prophecy showing you of Gad shall be overcome 
by a truth. Right. But he shall overcome at the last. But in the end of this captivity, our punishment, God is going to overcome. They're going to rise up and get revenge on our enemies. Now the next scripture is, is uh, Deuteronomy, the 33rd chapter and the 20th verse. And of Gad he said, Blessed be he that enlargeth Gad. So the Most High blessed Gad with a large proportion of the lands in North America, such as here in the United States, Canada. They had the largest areas of land mass. Read it on. He dwelleth as a lion. So he said, Gad dwells a lion. Now you know how a lion dwells? A lion roams the entire prairie, and he covers a large area of land for their uh, territory. And also, too, when he says he dwells as a lion, Gad used to paint their face with war paints, and it shows a warlike character. Read on. Okay. And teareth the arm. Now, when he said he teareth the arm, they would take a knife, and they would cut the skin and make the blood ritual or covenant, saying that we are brothers forever. This came from the so-called North American Indians. Read it off. With the crown of the head. And the crown of his head was what? Was the, the Indian bonnet that he wore upon his head. And we're going to show some pictures on that. You can right. show that picture. Let me show you the one from this book entitled uh, The Way of the Warrior. Okay, and inside this book, they show you the crown of the tribe of Gad. Okay, and it specifies here with the crown of the head because the tribe of Gad is letting you know in the last days would have a strange crown, a crown that's unusual to the kings of the earth. Now let's take a look at that crown. Okay. The title says crowning glories. And I'm glad it got the word crown there because it goes directly with the Bible. Crowning glories. Do you see that crown? That's a magnificent and beautiful crown. Okay, a war bonnet. All right. Uh, this, some more? In this book called Native American, Native American on page 81, it's going to see a group of Indian chiefs. There it is right here. Here's the crown of the head right here. There's no getting around that scripture. That's the proof right here. The crown of the head. There's another one I'm going to show you on page 85. And, and only top warriors wore these crowns for their victory in battle. Not this one, but this one over here on page 85. See that beautiful crown? That's from the scripture. And that's what the Native Americans, Indians wore upon their head. A crown, a beautiful crown of feathers. Right, you brought out that part about tear of the arm. Right, tear of right. the arm. That blood brother covenant. Okay, they would get a sharp stone or a knife and break their flesh and put their hands together so that the blood would mingle. I wouldn't suggest you do that today, though. You get AIDS and drop dead. So, but that was the prophecy on what the tribe of Gad would be doing in the last days. Okay? So what was the next scripture we were uh, going to There's more to that, too. There's oh, okay. more in the 21st. Verse. Right. Yeah, Deuteronomy 23, verse. 33 and 20. It 21. says, 21, excuse me. Yeah. And he provided the first part for himself. To so, I me, mean, when he divided different areas of the land, he took for himself. Read on. Because there were other tribes that came along with him. But Gad took their portion of their land. Read on. Because there, in a portion of the lawgiver, was he seated. So Gad also, too, when he came over, became a lawgiver. Because they took part in what? In the ceremonies, issuing the laws, and showing justice among themselves. Read on. And he came with the heads of the people. So when he said he came with the heads of the people, he came with, along with the other tribes, such as the, the uh, Puerto Rican Indians, known as the Boricua, Taino, and so forth. They didn't come alone. They came along with the rest of the tribes of Israel. Read on. He executed the justice of the Lord and his judgments with Israel. So he also executed justice and judgment too. That was part of Gad's duty when they came over here. Because Gad had laws, like we just read in the book of uh, James Adair, they kept the laws and the ceremonies, also wearing the fringes. You notice amongst the Native American Indians, they wore the fringes in all their garments. I'm going to show some pictures of that, too, when they wore the garments. That was a natural custom. Right. Let's get, let's get that in the... Uh, I'm going to get that. This is Numbers, chapter 15, verse 38. Speaking to the children of Israel, and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. 
So that was the law on for that the Mosai had given to the Israelites to wear fringes and upon your fringes you put a border of blue. As you see in many clips, you see the Native American Indians, we wore fringes, okay? And there's one where you can see, actually see the ribbon of blue that was according to the laws of the Most High. And the fringes represented the laws. There were over 600 laws that was given to our people. Okay, so now I'm going to go to First Chronicles 12 and verse 8. It says, And of the Gadites, they were separated themselves unto David. They were scouts. Like the so-called white man used the Apache as scouts to hunt other Apaches down. They were scouts in David's army. Read on. Into the hole to the wilderness, men of might and men of war. They were men of war, courageous, Geronimo, uh, Victorio, you name them. Great warriors, Santana, Sitting Bull. Read on. Fit for the battle. They were fit for battle, excellent warriors. Read on. That could handle shield and buckler whose faces were like the faces of lions. So, man, they paint their faces with war paint. Right. When they went out to war. I'm going to show, I'm going to show a clip of that from yes. this book entitled uh, After Columbus. This is from the Smithsonian Chronicle of the North American Indians. Okay. You got two photographs here showing you what the scripture means when it says whose faces were like the faces of lions, meaning like the brother brought out, they used to paint their face fiercely. So they look terrible when they went to war, just like a lion looks. Okay, I'm going to read on. It says, whose faces were like the faces of lions, of lions and, and were lions. as swift as the rose upon the mountain. They were swift. Swift. They was good. One, one main tribe that was famous for that were the Apaches. They was good for using uh, what you call ninja tactics tactics in warfare and the a history book tells you that the engines were so swift they could run 300 miles non-stop they were swift in war they could uh, run a horse that's how swift they were in battle that's the history and also there's another one in first chronicles 5 and 18 i'm going to show first chronicles 5 18 where it tells you right here it says it says the sons of reuben which are the seminar engines who are brothers to the uh not uh gadites it says and the gadites and the half-tribe Manessa, which are the so-called Cuban Indians, of valiant men, men able to bear buckler and sword, and to shoot with bow and skillful in war. And this book right here, what is this right here? It's showing the bows, the bows and the arrows. The Indians were skillful in using the bow, and they were skillful in war, like I named before, the many different uh, leaders of the of so-called Native American <coughs> Indians. So that's those are the scripture and prophecy showing you about the so-called Native American Indian.